the uh, the important thing is there is a there is a light at the end of the tunnel. So um, we want you to understand the impact and then move forward from that point. And we're willing to work with communities to help you do that. We have a pretty tried and true process for that that's worked in over 3,500 communities. Um, putting the community back together is is really uh, um, an important thing that we work with. Um, the uh, the reality is that. Um, um there's some issues to deal with and i think mary has some more comments yeah what we look at in um in our community development work is around the nature of community capitals <clears throat> and that um that language comes out of research by cornelia um, flores who is a researcher with um, extension and she um her work looks at what makes community sustainable and she says, you know, when we look at sustainable, the sustainability, it's simply how successful a community is at building bridges and bonds between its capitals. Now, bridges are the connection between the various capitals and those cap, I'll go through those capitals in a second. And bonds are the relationships with the people functioning within those capitals. And every community has a different level or degree of, of these capitals. Some are more extensively with built capital, that's like your hospitals, your airports, your schools. So we have built capital, financial capital, that's the financial resources or the banking um, opportunities that a community has. Human capital, that's the education of your, of your population. Do you have a highly skilled population that goes across all the different sectors or, you know, that, that helps with, um, helping the community resolve its own issues. Social capital is how organized the community is within, within its, um, its confines. That would be like your lion's clubs, your um, cattlemen's association, the gardening club, the clubs and organizations that help put the, the, um, the busyness or the, the work ethic into a community, that volunteer F, um, ability and people that can help make things happen and not expecting um, the government to have to do it for them. Political capital, and that is how connected um, and how effective our, our political um, entities are within a community. Cultural capital, some, um, that would be your, um, your norms of how we meet as a community. Do we always have a, a fair and rodeo or is there a harvest festival or do we have powwows? Um, you know, what is the history of the culture, the, the coming together for Pioneer Day. And then natural capital. Um, Wyoming is full of natural capital. In um, Teton County, we would think, you know, it's the mountains here in the park that we have. Others have the wide open spaces and the wildlife, and that's part of your natural community. So what you wanna have is in a, in a resilient community are, are effective bridges and bonds with the people that with, are within those those various capitals and then within the capitals themselves and then when we see that we need to work on building up our political capital we may want you know to put some effort there to make some connections um, legislatively or politically for our community and in having um, a successful plan it's you know we have a plan oftentimes we work on I've worked on a lot of plans there was a time when Jackson went through a lot of visions but we have a plan and what in disaster planning happens, you have a plan for con continuity within the community for if A happens, B happens, C happens, maybe might even be D and E. And that's part of this process that Scott is going to be sharing with us. Before I jump to the next slide for Mary, I should back up a little bit and, and people often ask why, why is Extension doing uh, this kind of planning efforts and helping communities facilitate? <clears throat> and the reality is that um, the Land Grant University and Sea Grant University missions for extension started back in 1914. Um, and our, our primary goal is to conduct educational programs and bring research-based information forward when people are dealing with critical issues. And we've been doing that for quite a while. I mean, even though, um, even though uh, the extension systems only formed the extension disaster network since 1993 to 95, the reality is that in 1918, 
since the only few county officials existed, uh, the extension staff, the county agents that were ag agents and the home ec agents were actually actively disseminating materials on, on surviving the Spanish flu. Um, partially, I know this because my grandmother was a 4-H club leader and told me about it. But the reality is we've been in, in public health education and helping communities deal with it for over 100 years. In, in the last 27 years, the Extension Disaster Education Network, which is just members of Extension across 84 universities and Sea Grant universities that form a coalition of, of expertise in disaster response preparedness, recovery, and mitigation. And we serve from 84 universities, there's over 400 of us, and we've helped 3,500 counties recover from disasters in the last 26 years. Uh, 400 plus disasters of every name and type you can think of. So with that, we'll move a little bit further into uh, community capitals. This is the health impact slide. Mary, is this mine or yours? Um, I believe this one is mine, I'm sorry. So we've talked about looking at what some of the statistics and research um, is showing us currently that's happening. So we're gonna go through a summary of some of the, the, the impacts that have affected our community. We know that um, the, the protective equipment was exhausted in our hospitals within 15 days This in COVID. That, that happened quicker in the rest, rest homes. Um, we know that most elective surgeries and non-emergent patient visits were shut down. And that had some real unintended consequences for people that had been diagnosed with cancer that have had to put those treatments off. As you can imagine, that is incredibly stressful for the people that are involved with that and their family members. People that have been needing to have a joint replaced and have been having to deal with bone on bone and the incredible pain that having that kind of an issue happening to you and the consequences of, of wearing down a bone even further than it should have been. So those, not having those elective surgeries um, has impacted other people um, immensely. We brought in 385 physicians and physician assistants from adjacent states. And it's interesting that in, um, in most disasters, you know, if we have a disaster in Wyoming, the people from the neighboring states come to help us. And with this particular pandemic, everyone was being affected. So, but here in Wyoming, that we have many communities that have no medical um, or don't have adequate medical support. So they were able to bring the 385 um, additional medical um, resources from adjacent states into our, our state. Dental offices started limiting visits. I know that here in Teton County, the only way you got to see a dentist was if it was a, a dire emergency. Um, and that, that does have consequences also for, um, for folks that are dealing with gum disease or it, it's an, an, a negative or has lasting impacts for some people. Many um, communities has the pharmacists to volunteer at clinics and rest homes. So it was difficult to get prescriptions processed as quickly statewide. Um, and here to get a prescription in Jackson, there was a time when they were asking people not to come into the, the facility where you would go to the pharmacy. You had to make arrangements to, to come outside or to have the, um, the police would deliver prescriptions for those that were at risk. Blood donations dropped less to 25% of the normal weekly donations, according to Bonfils and another company. I find that really interesting. It seems like every time we have a disaster, um, blood donation stop. I, I, and I speak that because um, at 9-11, Teton County was the largest donor of blood um, in the, in the um, Montana system. Billings would come down and, and get blood here and we were the largest donor. And after 9-11, people just stopped giving blood. So our leader, one of our leadership Jackson Hole groups took that on as a project to get people excited about um, or committed again to giving blood. But so in this pandemic, we had our blood um, donations drop. All hospitals and, and clinics have surpassed their surge capacity at least twice. And I don't think a lot of us understand what surge capacity is. And that is, you know, they have the, cap the capability of having X number of people in their emergency facility. And when you go one above, and, and we don't have large hospitals, 
Um, so if you want some places, it could be if you had nine people in the emergency room, you were above their surge capacity. Um, and so all of the hospitals and cl clinics sur surpass that. Um, medical costs in the state, when we were working on putting the data together for this um, presentation in the last couple of weeks, the medical cost exceeded $4.85 million and they were expected to go um, at least another 20 million more than that is what they're thinking they will be as we start um, adding up the, the data here in the, going in the future. The interesting thing also is that for many of our communities, our emergency management people are volunteers. So you look at um, emergency management and firefighters in a lot of communities are volunteers and, and they are getting swamped with COVID calls. And what that does is put people at risk that are volunteers that are going into homes to help people. And, um, and I suspect in a lot of Wyoming communities, but it is a situation here in Teton County where people were being asked to shelter at home. But I, mean, I, am for, I, I am an individual that lives alone in a townhouse. The townhouse next to me is rented and it has four children and five adults that live in that townhouse. And I know that we have a lot of, of service workers that are, that are sharing apartments and houses and it's many times it's two people per bedroom and they're sharing maybe one bathroom in a house or I know for a lot of our, um, a lot of people there's, with our immigrants, they're living one family per room in a house. So the sheltering together when people, the dispatch emergency people were having to go into these homes it was an unsafe environment for them to have to go into. Ready? So we, we saw impacts all the way across the board. We're gonna review some of them. The education impacts of COVID-19 in Wyoming, within almost a week, we saw all 47 school districts suspend classes. Um, colleges and universities um, released their students so that they could minimize exposure Almost all of our classes that were ongoing were transferred or made an effort to transfer to electronic delivery. Um, a lot of the issues on a K through 12 system, we didn't think about too much, especially with the younger kids. Um, I was kind of clued in when my, my uh, eight year old grandson called me and said, uh, Grandpa Scott, I can't touch my friends. I don't like it. Um, they'd see them on the screens, but uh, the idea of the jostling and the partnership and the interaction was a serious loss for a lot of those school children. We had uh, seven communities where uh, kids from 10 to 18 uh, got tired of being in their homes, would go out and naturally uh, congregate. And uh, being bored, uh, they ended up, some of them getting in trouble uh, doing everything from graffiti to uh, simply drifting around in the places they shouldn't be to actually uh, misdemeanor crimes. Several of the law enforcement agencies conferred with the COVID task force about how to deal with that. Um, it, it's still an ongoing issue. Um, and then we had challenges um, with processing both the requests and the needs and the documents, uh, um, both for the universities and the school districts. Uh, with a transition challenge between uh, kindergarten and first grade and a huge challenge with scholarship and admission getting kids from the high schools to the colleges and it, and it, we saw a parallel effort with the uh, seniors uh, that really didn't know how to apply for help or even ask for food or or um, get assistance or file for the family care uh, support um, and if you've tried to check, if you haven't got your deposit yet for uh, the CARE Act in your, and have to deal with the IRS, I've helped people with about 10 calls where for some reason the IRS is backlogged and hasn't processed their process yet. And it's the same thing with uh, processing for unemployment and other things. Uh, we saw transportation impacts. We thought we were going to be really good. We thought we'd... Uh, the Department of Transportation stepped up and said, we're gonna limit people interacting in restrooms that we don't have the money to disinfect. So we closed the state rest areas. It was probably not a good idea. We should have started it differently. Um, the truckers and all the delivery supplies uh, were in winter and we all know what winter in Wyoming is like. There's some transportation challenges that are natural, but when the only truckers you have delivering food 
and emergency medical supplies have no place to stop and take a break. Uh, it created an infrastructure issue. Uh, we also got the government to waive weight limits and time driving limits to make sure those supplies were landing appropriately. Uh, the testing kits, the tests sent back to the state lab and uh, emergency masks and gowns, we actually started what the COVID task force calls the Pony Express. Highway Patrol took the lead, uh, deputy sheriffs jumped on um, the Wyoming Forest Service and the Wyoming Fire Protection Districts, all joined forces to work with the team to uh, do uh, lap and tap, dropping stuff off to each other to make sure it got to certain communities. Or one patrolman would have a whole car load and split it three ways at a junction of a highway between him and two other officers or her and two other officers so that they could get it to communities. One of the funniest reports we had was uh, from a person that was stopped for speeding that said he was given a citation and let go. He thought he would have been arrested, but the back seat was full of viral test media that the state trooper was on the way to deliver. Uh, so there's priorities involved. Um, obviously, when we cancel all these large events and we cancel tourism and we cancel um, a lot of the school events and we cancel a lot of public events, and then we ended up canceling uh, energy processes. There's a huge drop in tax income to the counties and communities. Interesting side note is that as nationwide, as we restricted vehicle travel, uh, we saw the air cleanup. Uh, air quality is at the highest level it's been since 1971, which is it's one of the positives of all of this, I guess. You can breathe a little easier in park uh, as long as you're separated from somebody. That's interesting. We've seen a lot of people out, you know, enjoying the, the fresh air, but there are some communities that didn't allow people to go out and, and enjoy the fresh air. Some of the economic impacts, and um, Scott started talking about that, but, and I thought it was really interesting that there was hundreds of retirements in the early days of COVID. And that does have huge impact. I mean, it's fiscally nice to get rid of your your higher end um, employees. However, when you're in the middle of a crisis or having to recover from a crisis and you don't have that institutional memory, that can be a challenge going forward as communities are, are needing to plan. You can have the benefit of hiring someone younger, cheaper, um, but it, you know, I always tell people when they come into my office, it's a two year learning curve. Um, we know that 29,000 un were unemployed in the first 30 days, and that number has increased. I also have noted it's because as I work with some of the businesses here, I, I was um, visiting with a business, a restaurant in Lincoln County, and the um, owner had laid off their employees with COVID. They had shut for COVID, and then when they're able now to open up those employees have gone and found other jobs and so this restaurant owner is struggling to find employees um, now that they're able to open up the um, thousands of small bit you know, I mentioned this they closed I, I find that anytime I go out anymore to the grocery store or if I'm in a parking lot somebody's telling me their issues but you know you've, I think a huge issue can be for those that are 50 some to be aware, the 50 year olds um, are gonna have like kind of a double whammy. They got laid off having to use their retirement. I listened to a lady yesterday that, you know, she had to spend down her retirement in this time. She's not gonna have the, the years left. To, I mean, she's in her 60s. And so to build that back up is a concern. But, you know, will, will the older employees be hired back as people are coming back or businesses are coming back at a, at a slower or a lower or smaller workforce. Federal payroll protection plan ran out within the first 14 days. Um, families are financially stressed. And, and I just, yesterday, I, I, I ran into four different women, all of whom, um, I think I may have had a sign on me, you know, tell me your financial woes, that were really financially stressed to the point of tears. And also, stressed to the point of tears because family members needed their help. They were in that sandwich generation. They had single uh, millennials that weren't at home that were, were stressed in their own entity and 80 year old 
parents that were that were stressed and it was it's it's been a very stressful time as you all know for a lot of people and so as we look at our our plans going forward how we get all of us back and healed is going to be part of our our recovery plan <clears throat> scott mentioned on canceled events you know it's not just tourism but you know you get um it, there's the business travel has stopped that has an effect tourism has stopped those canceled events in the sales tax for communities particularly for communities like my like teton county our whole economy runs on sales tax so we have taken a huge sales tax hit fortunately this came towards the slower peak of our season during our spring break but still we had to cancel some major um, last end of winter and early spring events the county budgets are all being reduced and that's creating stress as people are wondering if they're gonna um, have to take cuts in in salaries fortunately um, the budgets that I am aware of that um, here in the county they're they're cutting they're, they haven't cut salaries yet um, but it's difficult to try to to go forward and you're trying to help people with less money so and then our disposable income has dropped um, by large amounts it was I have a nephew that's the president of a bank and it just as he's going through having to it's a season when you're going to be trying to get all the ag loans out to help the, the farmers and the ranchers and then they had the COVID hit and you had auto dealers who are trying to push sales trying to figure out what they can do to you know keep their income going um, so and people wondering, should I refinance because my, you know, the interest rates are lower. So there's a lot of um, stress on our financial system also as an economic impact. The Tourism and Recreation Center, it's um, the state and federal parks closed. That was kind of interesting here in Jackson because, you know, a lot of people consider that's their park. And like, why can't I go to the park and fish? They should just slow, close it to tourists. I am. Pinedale was people in Pinedale were concerned were they going to let all of the antler hunters come antler hunters I guess that's what they're called that go out and pick up the antlers off the off the public lands because they usually get they just come into the um, the towns to go out and find those antlers that has an impact are they going to bring all their COVID visitors coming we had people here in Jackson flying into Jackson and taxi drivers reported to me that they picked up people that came in on their private jets sicker than sick because they wanted to be sick here in Wyoming, not from where they were. Seasonal employees are an issue. People that work seasonally um, may not get hired back, but you know, you've people had the the investments <clears throat> to purchase what you needed for the seasonal um, in business do I buy it? Do I not buy it? Do I order it? it was a huge issue for our businesses. So those kinds of companies that stock and supply for this coming season are impacted. Having the um, fishing licenses suspended, you know, that the out of state sports licensing, I didn't realize this is a huge percentage of our Wyoming game and fish income. Um, guides, catering, housing units are all preparing for the worse. We're finding out here that Jackson Lake Lodge is not opening for the season. In fact, Zantara, because of the new park regulations on housing, they usually hire around 4,000 employees because of not having adequate, they can't share bathrooms going forward. They would only be able to have 800 instead of 4,000 employees, so the park concessions are not going to be opening this summer. Now that could have a positive impact on the neighboring communities around the park economically. But those are just some of the, the, the situations we have now. Those families that were that love to come to the park and work as seasonal employees, they're usually people that have retired early, they're going to have a, an economic impact because of this. So <clears throat> obviously in Wyoming, if you've been around at all, we have three major industries, energy, uh, agriculture, and tourism. And it, it, by income, it goes energy, tourism, and agriculture. And normally, uh, the two that vary up and down are energy and tourism. Energy varies more than the others. Agriculture has always been our baseline. Um, but th this COVID interruption, uh, we did, when we first started, we didn't think it was going to be much of an impact to agriculture because agriculture is seen by the National Security Act as essential industry. 
the catch was that and almost immediately we realized that we had seasonal herders that come in, especially for sheep, um, and they come from other countries. They go home on a federal permit when they're not herding. And even though we could get approval to uh, bring them, there was no transportation corridors that they could afford from foreign countries. Uh, that meant we have a shortage of herders. Um, the beef industry here and the uh, lamb industry here export over 90% of their uh, finished carcass um, to slaughter in other locations. We've done some remarkable work with the, the lamb industry where we had producers that banded together and bought the lamb slaughter plant in Greeley and formed the Mountain States Lamb Co-op and have been delivering lamb to high-end restaurants across the United States for several years and it improved the margin for those producers. <coughs> That industry, uh, the uh, Mountain States Lamb Co-op plant and two feedlots, once they filled up uh, their twice their normal cooler stock with lamb cuts uh, and the restaurants across the United States closed, their sales dropped to nothing. In the process, we have about 150 largely invested producers uh, from our state that are involved in a corporation that had to declare bankruptcy and that there's no outflow opportunity for this year's lambs, which are dropping on the ground right now. Now the beef, uh, we have just under 2 million head of yearlings a year. Over 90% of them go to uh, the, one of the 25 major plants to be processed and that meat is sold outside of Wyoming. Uh, 25 plants are closed because of COVID impacts across the United States and in the process, we have seen the price of beef per pound drop to the point that most producers are losing between $105 and $150 per head uh, before they even wean them off the cows this fall. We're gonna see this come to a head this fall. So there's some efforts to try to process more beef here in Wyoming, but we have really limited facilities to do that. The wool shipments that we finished uh, shearing in the early um, um, April, we have about 67,000 fleeces that are usually worth about six and a half dollars a pound. They go to other countries to be processed, come back and they're milled into a lot of products. Um, we have one mill in Wyoming that's commercial. Um, they can do about three bales a week. Um, we ended up with 67,000 fleeces put into storage in substandard locations because we could not ship it to New Zealand and Australia for processing. So the price of wool for our producers who were on a thin margin because of the lamb impacts, dropped from about the mid $6 per pound to down just over $2 per pound, which is well below, below their investment level. Uh, the supply shipments for a lot of things jumped up uh, when we are shipping medical stuff and their shippers are focused on it. It's all <clears throat> more expensive to get shipments for agriculture. And then we saw a lot of people try to shift RAM and bowl sales to virtual sales with, with no social interaction, with no ability to physically evaluate that male animal you're looking at investing large dollars into. So even though that's working to a certain degree, we have seen uh, some pretty dramatic drop in the numbers of um, buyers and of prices. Back to you, Mary. Well, it's just social events. This is mine, I guess. Um, one of the big things about the West is uh, handshakes. Uh, agreements are handshakes. Um, the first thing that was a, a victim of COVID was the handshakes. Um, an example, I bought three bulls when I was 16 years old by a handshake and writing a note on a napkin at Torrington. Drove 300 miles home and they were perfectly good with that handshake. That's been a tradition for us. It, it, it extends to our cultural events. Uh, it extends to being able to uh, reach out to family when they need help. Uh, we have a lot of postponed celebrations. Some of them went virtual, everything from birthdays to graduations to weddings to um, anniversaries, and it's all been impacted by this, not the least of which is, is an impact directly on our faith-based organizations that had to adjust. And then some of our cultural things like museums and fundraisers and, and stuff like that. Uh, this has hit virtually everybody across the board. Everybody's trying to adjust. 
and they're doing a really commendable job, but we need to focus and come up with plans to help them move it farther and, and deeper. Over to Mary. We looked at what is <clears throat> seniors have been a, a population group I've worked with for several dec decades. And, you know, they, they tend to just, just by virtue of life happening, feel a sense of isolation as their friends, their age groups start <clears throat> dying or moving away. Seniors had limited food um, and they still, they still do. I mean, you can't come to the senior center and, and congregate. And it's not so much the food here in Jackson that you come to the senior center for, it's the, the socialization and not feeling so isolated. And the senior center still, you know, you could drive up and pick up a, a styrofoam package of food if you needed it, but it just limited the social services. The, um, <clears throat> As I had mentioned earlier, they, if they don't have enough time to rebuild their retirement account if they're having to spend it down now because of this. Our public transportation ended. So for our seniors that were depending on public transportation to get to the grocery store, they had really limited options. They couldn't go for checkups. They could get their meds, but they had to be delivered to them. I'm on the board of directors for our low income senior housing and we stopped taking new tenants because we didn't want um, the introduction of, of COVID because of, of moving people into a facility where you've pretty much, I mean, the group kind of has its own sets of germs that it's living with. And so that's negatively impacting that whole project. It's you know, the, the rents are determined by what seniors can pay, but now we've had a substantial number of units that have sat empty, and that does affect the bottom line because we run pretty much at um, no profit. The other thing is that home health services got canceled, and so bathing and sanitary needs were not necessarily avail weren't available the way they used to be for our seniors. So they have had and limited access to family. That has been a huge impact um, for the seniors in this COVID um, situation. So now we're going to start talking about you know, intermixing some discussion in our the rest of our slides about what do we do? How do we mitigate? Where do we move forward? We'll still discuss some other impacts and some uh, demographic um, factors. But we're going to start talking also about how do we mitigate the impacts? What processes do we use to just minimize disruptions? And, and, and that includes public gatherings being halted, services lost, businesses hurt. Um, and the, the really important part is to realize that there's a way out of this, or at least there's a way to minimize the impact, which we call mitigation in, in emergency management. Um, there's been a lot of adjustments for citizens, as we've discussed, um, virtual meetings, there's new risk. Um, man, this is, a, this is a hacker's paradise, everybody's online. Um, there's, there's new social patterns, and some of those social patterns we don't think will completely switch back. We're going to see more options for online education, online interaction, um, I've seen more pet videos in the last two months than I've ever thought I'd see. But childcare is an issue because now we have a lot of parents who had used childcare and childcare is under new restraints and conditions that can't use the pre-existing childcare structure, uh, which is gonna affect their jobs and how they work. <clears throat> Any other thoughts, Mary, before I jump? I think childcare as we look at a plan forward, and it's always been an issue, but if anything COVID has taught us is that <clears throat> you can have your emergency people that are volunteers out helping your community if they don't have childcare. So we need to be putting that in all of our plans um, going forward, how we can help with that. So the, the big thing is we, in our discussion and preparation for this and looking at all the communities we're impacted specifically in Wyoming, it's pretty apparent that one size does not fit all. Um, well, there's different internet available at levels. Um, broadband width is a huge issue. Uh, there's different social structures. There's 
There's different available volunteer cores in each community. And when we start looking at this and we start working with communities to, to develop a plan to mitigate and be ready and be resilient for future impacts, it's gonna be community by community because we have to take into account the specifics of each community. Uh, the comment that was made uh, a while back was a, a really good one and that was that uh, someone says, well, we're all in the same boat. And then someone with a little more overview said, no, we're not. We're all in the same storm. We're in different boats. And our ability to survive the storms can depend on our boat or help from the other boats. Um, so we don't, as a group, as a community development and disaster educators, we don't have silver bullets. What we have is a lot of ammunition. And we have a process that's worked in the past for everything from hurricanes to floods to tsunamis to wildfires to disease outbreak that we dealt with during the avian influenza and the, and the uh, norovirus outbreaks and multi-state things that we help respond to. And we know it works to help strengthen communities, but each community is different and the goal is resilience. So we're gonna try to provide ammunition and processes that help people move towards that more resilient impact. A good example, years ago in 2006, we had three counties in Nebraska that faced a large, several hundred thousand acre wildfire, you know, impacting about five towns and three counties. And they asked the extension to help uh, pull together the ag responses. And it took nine and a half hours uh, to get that response off the ground and moving. Uh, over the next six years, we trained, we worked with communities, we planned, and we had another fire that hit five counties. And in the process, those community entities that had been involved in that, within 47 minutes had teams moving out and taking care of the issues. And it's all about capability, capacity, and planning. This is Mary's. When we look at, um, in epidemics, there's many people that are affected differently. We've kind of hit on this, but just to be mindful or be thinking about this, you know, the young children without having daycare parents, I, I, my my office manager has one child and she, she can't just leave him at home. And I know you all know that that's probably, I don't need to say what, how we help older adults. And it's interesting, like I'm now becoming an older adult. I'm getting into that, um, that, that category. And I am vulnerable for COVID on four different levels. And so it's just being aware of, my own vulnerability as I'm, I'm working and I've been very fortunate to be working for an organization that is very respectful of um, the, the needs of their employees um, because of health conditions. But I just had a conversation yesterday with a, a restaurant owner. Um, I, if I go outside anymore, it's like I'm gone for a long time because I walk into people and he was wanting, he needed somebody to bounce off this. He has an employee who is a, somebody I've known from a long time, for a long time and has actually grew up in North Dakota where I grew up and um, this individual has a serious health issue and he wasn't sure that, he goes, I just don't think I can ask her to come back because she's just too, she's too at risk and I as an employee, she will do anything for me, but I don't wanna put her at risk with working with the public and he was really struggling do I bring her back? Do I not bring her back? And so um, that's a, that isn't, I mean, I know that it's going to seriously impact her and I can see where it's also an anguish for him about what's the right thing to do. People that are other abled, I mean, the, the folks that have hearing issues, you know, how do they hear about in our populations? Um, our non-English, we have a lot of non-English speaking. Well, we have a lot of people who have English as their second language. It's probably a better way for me to put that here. They can speak some English, but I mean, this is pretty serious stuff that they need to understand about wearing masks and washing their hands and how to protect themselves. And then they're also living in situations that really make being mindful of, 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 washing your hands important but the other interesting thing that I just am now realizing that they couldn't go to the laundromat and a lot of folks that are living in in these um mul in in condensed areas or, or together they use 
they use our laundromats. And so those were closed. And we were asking people for their safety to wash their hands and wash their clothes when they may have been out being um, in an area where they could have gotten contaminated with COVID. And I don't think it certainly wasn't on my radar that laundromat should have been considered an essential service for folks. And then also becomes the issue of do they, they don't have the quarters to use in the, in the, the washing machine. So one of our churches just was, you know, had quarters out so people could get in when they finally opened because they didn't have the quarters to, to be able to wash their, um, their clothes. <clears throat> A thing I think that um, to be really mindful of is our grocery store and food service workers. They typically get low paid wages and um, they are really at high exposure. And as they were trying, as our restaurants were trying to do carry out, you know, I don't think a lot of people are mindful of the fact that food service workers get paid a very little salary and they try to live on the tips. And I um, overheard somebody saying, well, I'm not going to leave a tip. They didn't do any service for me. They just brought me a bag of food. And um, so it's, there's just, they're vulnerable. I mean, there they are working for their, you know, dollar 18. I don't think it's a dollar 18. I think it's $3 now that they is the minimum wage as a food service worker, but they really rely on those tips. So those are some of our vulnerabilities. And I'm sure there are more. So when you look at it in influence where among working adults where you have 20% becoming ill because of the influenza outbreak and you're ill and trying to take care of other situations in your in your life, it's it's difficult. One of the other groups that the state and the county agencies have been dealing with is the homeless population. And they, and they fit into that last discussion with a few um, side notes, caveats. Um, we've had difficulty, we've set up shelters and food systems for them in about 14 communities and, and they um, tend to ignore safety guidelines and move out of the center and back in every day and the, the authorities in those communities are struggling with how to keep them safe and how to keep the community safe when you have people that are tested positive, isolated, and, and then they just refuse to leave or refuse to stay. But one of the homeless people made a comment uh, that was shared and that was, you know, when you're living on the street and you can freeze to death every night, overdose every night, or be killed every night, being concerned about getting a disease is really not the top of their priority list. So they're going to be a continuing challenge. Uh, some of the shelters have refused to let them back in after a couple of violations. And some of those homeless people have chose to move to other communities and other states. One of the things we need to think about, especially planning for communities, is what's next? Um, you know, what's coming up? Um, we've got to, this issue where... Um, in the planning process, um, we know regular patterns. Wyoming is one of those unique places where we have uh, a thousand percent uh, times our population of visitors that roll in here every year. Uh, and we interact with them, we serve them, we cater to them as part of our industry. So what's next? Um, Mary mentioned the fact that we have uh, wealthy people that have private planes that flew into Teton County and and didn't file flight plans, but they dropped in and then called the cab and and they have summer homes. So most of our western counties have a certain element of that. Some of the north central counties have the same issue. Uh, and to be totally honest, if I lived in Manhattan and I owned a home in Wyoming and I wanted to reduce my risk or get away from the risk of uh, flying to my summer home makes a lot of sense. But every responder, everything like that that we have to deal with um, is gonna be involved in, in coping with those folks. So what happens, if, uh, what happens if the next wave changes our management impacts us? Where do we go from there? Uh, consider the impacts. I think this is Mary's. What, you know, what we're going to want to look at when we're doing our plans are what are the demographics and it's, it's as of the organization. And as I just can mention, I think one of the nice things about having all of us work together on something, we're smarter than one of us. 
And so looking at some of the impacts we were going to want to be thinking about, and if we had time face to face, what, you know, what are the demographics? What are your vulnerable populations? Where, where are, where are those things we're not really aware of that we should possibly be aware of that could help us move through a, a, an epidemic? Um, how many people are on your staff? So what if 20% become ill? What if 40% become ill? Um, you know, so what are, what are going to be your contingency plans? You know, we had a lot of contingency plans here in Jackson for dis disasters. And I know using our office facility is a contingent contingency plan for a lot of entities. But COVID, this pandemic was a, a, a bit different than you, know, you can't bring a bunch of people together in one room um, to just wait out a fire. So there are, that's why we're talking about the A, B, C, D, E kinds of plans. So if you have the <clears throat> quarantining in effect, it, now we're coming into how we do the disinfecting, helping communities get to do that and social distancing map, um, measures that we should be doing and dealing with increased rates of um, absenteeism. And I think in, in particularly the communities I'm working with here in Teton Sublet and Lincoln County primarily, they aren't going to have their seasonal employees like they've had in the past. So that's going to be an impact for their businesses. So when we're talking about impacts, let's talk about uh, institutions and businesses. What happens if 30% or more of your staff and, and the team gets sick? What happens if you can't meet um, and the public gatherings are halted? What happens if you're the um, handicapped organization and all of a sudden public transportation is not available for people, or food delivery stops. And we've seen this in this instant in the family care challenges, and all of it ties into uh, some little things on the side, like make sure you fill out your census, because that's going to determine part of the things we have available. Uh, but when we go into community discussions, unique impacts on communities. Um, for instance, uh, Casey is a good example. I, I, a lot of time there over the years and they don't have much for medical facilities they have a 50 mile drive to buffalo for limited facilities or a 70 mile drive to casper for some pretty strong facilities but the impacts that hit them there uh, what if their emts get positive and nobody can haul people um, what happens if there are two organizations in town get hit um, their tax income drops off, um, uh, their relief support can't get there. Um, and it, we had some broadband conferences last year that talked with the organizations from the USD Farm Service Agency about expanding broadband to every person in Wyoming. And in that conference, we had about 14 of the vendors that provide those services. And when the discussion happened in work groups, we actually drew maps up some of the rural areas and said, okay, can you get it up here? Can you get it to the Red Wall uh, north of Powder River so all those families out there have broadband? And they said, well, how many customers are there for this 126 miles? And we said, 10. And the vendor said, I uh, can't do that. Not economically feasible. And we're going to find that as one of those challenges for small communities that are distant is that our demand for increased technology is, uh, is going to be easier said than done in some cases. Mary? I, <clears throat> I love this um, presentation because you know, our pets are part of our family. And I, um, I know there are some people who are simply not going to accept the fact that you know, pets can harbor, dis harbor disease, but it is a reality. And with the... Um, this COVID CDC has verified that cats and dogs can get COVID from people. So there are um, things that we need to be planning for, for our pets. And I know in a lot of disasters that, that, you know, taking care of the pets and, and um, bringing your pets to safety is a huge issue. So, I mean, that would be something we'll want to have a discussion about as we're looking at how we plan for resilience, but, you know, do you let your working dogs be exempt? to what you might be doing about just domestic animals. <clears throat> An epidemic may not be just a one-time occurrence. It could, um, it can last six to eight weeks. And as we're, we're going to be learning a lot about on how, what we're going to want to do going forward from this pandemic. 
um, back with Y2K when I was working with Teton County and preparing for the, the huge disaster that was supposed to happen when everything was going to shut down when at midnight on December 31st, 1999, because the computers weren't going to be able to handle the moving over to 2000. <clears throat> and we were working on a group called Project Impact and trying to figure out all the what we would do if all of a sudden all our technology and everything kind of shut down and we went into days of darkness. Um, now we have experience with the pandemic. Um, we know that they can occur any time of the year. They can take place multiple times. So about the time we think we're recovering, we've all got our toilet paper restocked. It can hit us again. Um, so it's being, being aware of what the, the wave pandemic is. And I think that's one of the advantages that extension can bring is that we've got access to the data. And I mean, I know there are some people that can never have enough data, but we do need to have data. And what kind of, and I'll talk about this here in a couple of slides, what is a unique thing that I've learned here in this pandemic. But I think that um, a public health mandate that tells you that you've got to close your doors becomes a huge issue for families and that can, or, and businesses and for everyone. And that can be happening in waves through um, pandemics as well as any other disasters. Wyoming's retirement had um, 2,900 people apply for their retirement because of this, whether it was work stress or as it was just something they didn't want to do again. As I mentioned earlier, that's a lot of people suddenly to lose that institutional memory. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure that I just got an email today from a colleague who is deciding that that's COVID is um, a good time now to move on to do something else. So normal functions and activities are going to change. Organizations don't have emergency over time. You know, our safety supplies, everybody's struggling to try to find hand sanitizer. Mental health issues are, um, we are fortunate in, in Jackson to have an amazing um, community mental health um, cadre of people. I know there are some communities that would be really strained on that, but it's, it's an issue that we have and it's uh, it, just like I mentioned, when I'm going out on the street, no matter where I go, somebody is needing to talk and just having that ability to provide people a safe space to, to um, talk and to vent is, is a part of helping with mental health. But that's a serious issue that we need to help people with when people are financially stressed. We know the research tells us that an individual can handle three stressors at a time and you get them a fourth or a fifth stress that's when the mental health issues will start triggering in. So some of the questions um, we should be thinking about, how do you plan to continue delivering your information? What are you gonna be capable of or how are you gonna be planning to be capable to provide for those that are homebound? What are you gonna do to maintain support structures of your organization and the people you serve individually if they cannot physically come together? Um, what are your situations that you're in? And so it's looking at how quick can your community become ready to face another impact? And that takes time. And so many of our decision makers in our communities are volunteering. So it's, it's a process. And using a neutral third, which is what we in community development can serve for you as a neutral third to come and help you in with the processes might help as far as streamlining that planning process. Um, Unemployment benefits, we all know. So these are some of the response, responses that people have to their communities that we would want to be planning A, B, C, D, E for for the various epidemics or crises that could happen our way. So we know that pandemics can, can happen and there can be six to eight week we, uh, waves based on epidemiology studies and, and interaction levels. Um, and also we know that volunteer numbers can drop depending on con con consecutive waves of impacts on communities. So we wanted to give you a couple examples of the demographics of communities and, and how they differ just in our state. And, and I'll cover one and then Mary will pick up and review a couple. Laramie and Albany County, uh, having been in emergency services there, the population is about 36,000. And it includes part of the resources on the uh, left, which is 13,400 students. Um, it's at a high elevation. The hospital's at actually at 7262. 
Um, the hospital has a surge capacity, and I worked there for years, and it, you gotta understand this is a 150 bed hospital that the ICU can handle eight, the ER can handle 10, and this surge capacity is only 15. That means that once they reach their fill, they can only handle 15 more people, and you're looking at 40, 45,000 people in that community. Uh, their EMS system runs three ambulances, uh, plus some volunteers adjacent in small towns. Uh, they can haul about six to eight people at a time. The airport has limited um, service, which our, our associate director can probably attest to. Um, it does have access points better than some locations, has Interstate 80 running through it and four state roads. Uh, at the same time, having worked there in, in law enforcement, I can tell you that I've seen the roads closed virtually every month of the year. Um, so they are fortunate that they have a teaching hospital with 200 uh, doctors in the region and over 600 nurses. Uh, the vet testing labs there, there's five law enforcement agencies that have 145 peace officers on the average. There's some housing options. Uh, there's 14 clinics uh, for a variety of things. And they do have television and radio capacity, uh, but they also have 4,000 K through 12 students. The average income, if you're expected to pay for your own stuff for a while in Albany County is only $24,000 per person on the average. 25%, almost 26% poverty level. Uh, that's just the nature of college towns. Kids are getting by on top ramen and a few other things to get through school. Uh, major industries education. Demographics is interesting in Laramie. 31% uh, are in that 18 to 24, another 18% in 25 to 34, which is often includes a lot of non-traditional students. And we only have 17% over 55, but we have regular road blockages. Mary? I was, when we were talking about what counties <clears throat> to include in this, I had recently have been asked to do some review um, being outside review or some for some researchers and one of the research projects was the um, economics of the Rocky Mountain West and how the, the various states and the counties within those states vary with how their economies run and then another one was looking at populations across the counties and I was incredible I mean, as I was reading through Wyoming's it was I didn't realize that Wyoming's 23 counties are so economically diverse. I just, I, I mean, I kind of know the counties I work with, but it, it's very, um, we're not all the same. It's one shoe doesn't fit all, which is why it's so important that we plan locally. So let's take a look comparing Newcastle or Weston County from um, Laramie County. It has no colleges, has one hospital, three clinics, and it can handle a surge capacity of five individuals. It's emergency management services two people, maybe four at the most, volunteers. No airport regular service. It has three access to state highways, but it again is like you all know, all Wyoming is affected by weather. Medically, they have 10 doctors and 17 nurses, no labs in there at 25 peace officers. They have very limited housing and very no media. Their population is right at 4,000 in the town and 7,000 in the county. It's at 4,100 feet. It's a, it's a bit lower than Laramie or Albany County is, and it has a higher income than Albany because it doesn't have all those students, but it's at about 29,000. It has a lower poverty level than um, Albany, which is at 17%. Its economy is ag-based, but it does have some tourism. And its population, thir a third of its population is over 55. It has 820 school age children and its nearest advanced care is they need to drive to Rapid City, South Dakota. So let's look at that as compared to Teton County. We have a lot of federal agencies in our area. We have two hospitals and 10 clinics. Um, emergency management system of four, um, up to eight capacity and those are all volunteers. The airport is the busiest in the state. We have about 300,000 travelers each year. And I think that's a little bit higher um, this past year than it had been on average because we just really peaked out in tourism. Um, we have access to three highways, although all those accesses are um, over mountain passes or through canyons. And we had a snow incident 
three years ago that totally isolated our valley from the outside world. And that is one of our big issues is that we could get where you, with avalanche season, where you just couldn't get here or get out. 120 drivers, or I'm sorry, 120 doctors. And we have 100 nurses. We don't have a lab. We have 125 on average police officers. And that's probably because, you know, we go from a, a population of um, about 10,000, 12,000 people. We never really know how many we have here. And that I need to remember to mention census. But we have 4,800 kids in our school system. And we have to have the police officers for when the summer visitors are here. And we have over 4 million visitors that come during the summer season. Our poverty level is at 5%, and that's mostly service industry. And I would think that if we took our second homeowners out, which is a huge percentage of our population, our poverty level would be higher. Because if you notice here, it says the average income is 88,000. Doesn't take very many millionaires or billionaires to counter that when you're looking at average in numbers, because the average service worker does not make anywhere near $80,000 a year. Our low income group usually are, have English as a second language. We have a huge investment in property here. It's very expensive. And um, there are a lot of support industries here. And we've got more nonprofits here in Teton County than most states have. And nonprofits are that social capital that you, you, know, you want your community to have successful bridges and bonds with. Scott? So part of the process of helping communities lead their way to resilience is, is undertaking what we consider a vulnerability analysis. And vulnerability analysis is working with communities to identify their resources, to identify their capability and their capacity, and then looking at their risk and helping identify for them where they need to make improvements or build strength uh, to cover gaps. And we, that's done with, uh, community development and with disaster education programs using a Carver shock analysis for risk management. And we look at every emergency support function, everything from law enforcement down to agriculture, natural resources, public health, you name it. When we go through that process, it helps a community to clearly identify what they can do, what they can't do, and what they need to do. And in the process of identifying what they need to do, for instance, right now with some industries, we have people call and say, well, what can we do to help our, our economic balance right now? What, what work opportunities are there? And, and then we can talk about delivery services or, or broadband installation and then a number of other things where there's still new opportunities for work to sustain communities. But the process of walking through a vulnerability analysis to enhance capacity and capability that's what we refer to as resilience building. And that process is, has to be individual communities working with facilitators that know how to lead them through the process. And they have to be able to identify their unique demographics or unique characteristics and their priorities. And so there's no one size fits all, but it is possible to move forward for each community and make a difference in the future and to make them stronger and more resistant so that if the same impact happens, they'll only have a third as much of the challenge as they did previously. We look at our emergency management. I, I found this quote from Anne Frank. I don't think of all of the misery, but of the beauty that still remains. And I think that's the um, optimism that we find in Wyoming. One of the um, impacts that I, that I've not mentioned that I, I think we should is the census. This is a census year and the census makes a huge difference in the amount of um, income that we are eligible for as communities and as a state. And I believe that the, um, you know, the census, I know the census takers haven't been going door to door in Teton County and um, that could be an, another um, negative impact on our counties if we don't get an adequate and accurate census count in our in our communities and in our state. The emergency managers have estimated, this is an interesting factoid for you to, for us to end today with, that we've estimated that every resident in Wyoming has offered at least three acts of kindness. 
So if you think about that, that's 2 million acts of kindness that have taken place in Wyoming during this um, pandemic. I believe we're really blessed to be able to call Wyoming home. And I know that Wyoming has a bright and wonderful future because the people in Wyoming have this tremendous capacity to care for each other. And we also have a tremendous independent spirit and a survivor's attitude. And um, so I, I, I believe that we can all work together and, and create a, a resilient and hopeful future for our communities. We would hope that you would consider giving one of us a call, Scott, myself or Michelle, <clears throat> or you can call your local extension offices and um, they can they can make contact with us. So now we would circle back a little bit to some chat items. Um, um, the um, um, we have a number of people that need to get involved in this stuff, including Lenny, who's a new emergency manager over in Carbon County, has meetings. We understand not everybody that can be on and wanted to be on could be here. Um, we, and there was a question about all clinics passing surge capacity. Um, if we look at the surge capacity for the Joint Council on Accreditation of Hospitals in Wyoming, their data indicates the total surge capacity in Wyoming is about 121 people uh, for the whole state, uh, for clients above and beyond normal. So when we average that out across the state, there's a few clinics that diverted their patients, but if they'd handled them, they'd been past surge capacity. But in general, yes, every capacity we had exceeded the surge, were, the surge capacity was exceeded by the number of patients, especially in the first three weeks. Um, so the, 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 from this point on, we, we encourage people, if you wanna share this, uh, let us know. Uh, we're recording it, we can share it out. The reality is that there is a roadmap to help communities move forward and mitigate impacts, even something as big as this. And I really appreciate the, the ladies from the community development education team uh, being willing to, to collaborate and develop this. We started with a, a pandemic recovery uh, material from the Extension Disaster Education Network, and then we morphed it and adjusted it and tweaked it so it was Wyoming. Um, we appreciate you guys signing on and uh, appreciate any support you can give us to help communities. Mary? Thank you all. Have a wonderful day. Any other comments? Everybody good? <laughs>